PCBs, a chemical poison that is also a national problem. Five years after Congress banned the manufacture of PCBs, studies show that nine out of ten Americans have at least some of the substance in their bodies. And there is still no answer to the question of how to get rid of the millions of pounds of PCBs that were produced before the ban. We'll examine the issue tonight with an official of the Environmental Protection Agency, a spokesman for the chemical industry, and a scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund. And we'll have a report on the Canadian team climbing Mount Everest. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. Polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. Whether or not you've ever heard of them, whether or not you know what they are, there is a much better than even chance that their existence affects you, may indeed be poisoning you. 450 million pounds of PCB are still in industrial use. 150 million additional pounds of the chemical are in the free environment. And while Congress has banned their future use, the simple reality of the story we're about to tell you tonight is that banning a chemical is one thing, disposing of it is altogether something else. As environmentalist Barry Commoner once pointed out, there really is no such thing as waste. Everything has to go somewhere. Where is part of what the story is about? Why is the other part? Peter Lance has been compiling this report for several months. Father, if you don't move, you will be arrested. It might have been Selma, or Montgomery, or Little Rock, but this was not a civil rights demonstration. These North Carolina residents were willing to go to jail to try and stop the burial of a toxic chemical in their county. They have been marching for the past two weeks. I think that these people have a right to resist the chemical warfare that's been declared against them by the state of North Carolina. In this case, the chemical was PCB, polychlorinated biphenyl, a substance considered so toxic that the men who clean it up wear protective clothing like this. Congress banned PCBs five years ago after laboratory tests showed that the chemical caused cancerous tumors in rats and birth defects in monkeys. The monkey on the left is normal. The monkey on the right was fed low doses of PCBs. The presence of PCBs are potentially one of the most serious public health issues we face. The significant large amounts of PCBs already in existence may be a major environmental headache for many years to come. Studies now show that 9 out of 10 Americans have PCBs in their body fat, and a study of nursing mothers done for the EPA found that 8% had PCBs in their milk at levels higher than allowed in cow's milk. The concern is that these chemicals will be present in our environment for decades to come, and that we're each being exposed slowly on a continuing basis. Until the ban five years ago, industry turned out 1.4 billion pounds of PCBs. The chemical was used primarily as a cooling agent in electrical transformers and capacitors. Hundreds of thousands of them were located on utility poles or in the basements of large public buildings. The problem now is that most of them are still out there. A major loophole in the government ban allowed 99% of all existing PCB equipment to remain in service. In the judgment of EPA at the time the regulations were issued in May 1979, there was no significant human exposure from those intact non-leaking units. That was back in 1979. The problem now is that all over the country, those PCB units are beginning to leak. Washington, D.C., a study by the General Services Administration found that half of the transformers in federal office buildings were leaking. These transformers in the U.S. Customs Building were found leaking into cake pans, and PCB discharges were also discovered at the White House and the Pentagon. Something like 50% of the transformers in the Washington, D.C. area, that is, that is of 822, 494 are leaking or show signs of past leaks, and 20 of these require diking to reduce the possibility of environmental contamination. In Los Angeles County alone, we are experiencing between 12 and 15 PCB discharges per month from pole-mounted equipment. 
and many of these do occur on residential properties. Property like the backyard of housewife Aileen Andres. In 1980, a PCB capacitor bank like this ruptured on the pole above the Andres home. PCB oil spilled into the yard where Mrs. Andres' granddaughter used to play. This is how the yard looks today. We don't have any idea when we can ever use it again. We haven't seen or heard from the Edison Company in months. So this is just what we're left with. In a report issued to the EPA last spring, the utility industry admitted that as many as 4,800 PCB transformers showed some sign of leaking. The report also estimated that up to 64,000 capacitors could develop leaks within the year. Nonetheless, the report concluded that the leaks, quote, do not pose a significant risk to human health or the environment. The Chemical Manufacturers Association and the industry in general believes that the chronic health effects of PCBs have been greatly overstated. You mentioned the name PCBs, and uh, the general populace will think, my goodness, I've uh, walked by a piece of PCB equipment, I'm going to get cancer. Just the mere mention of the name uh, strikes fear in the hearts of people. Uh, there is a unique toxicity uh, associated with this compound. Yet we know that just a casual exposure results in uh, no health effects uh, at all that can be detected. The public reaction to PCBs may have something to do with the way environmental officials deal with the chemical. Consider what happened last year when a construction accident sent a cloud of natural gas over downtown San Francisco. 30,000 office workers were evacuated. Later, the gas was found to contain oil with extremely low levels of PCBs. Oil that covered the trees, the sidewalks, the buildings, and dozens of cars parked on nearby streets. Despite the low levels of the chemical, the entire neighborhood was washed down and all 30,000 office workers were told to destroy their clothing. In August, the EPA issued a regulation that would ban PCB transformers near food and feed facilities. The ban goes into effect in 1985, but the new rule won't come soon enough for the Gateway Food Company near St. Paul, Minnesota. Last month, PCB transformers began leaking on the roof of the company warehouse. More than $50,000 in food had to be destroyed. Why did you wait until 1985 for the regulation to go into effect? Because it would not be practical to phase them out sooner. The distribution system for transformers and capacitors just could not supply the demand that would be created if, for instance, we uh, put in an instantaneous phase out. Because of the new government controls, many utilities are now replacing their old PCB equipment. This storage yard in New York, for example, contains dozens of old transformers. But the solution to one problem is now creating a new one. What to do with the chemical? PCBs are expensive to dispose of because there are only two incinerators in the entire country where the government allows high-level PCB waste to be burned. The government wants to open more incinerators, but its plans have been slowed by public protest. We're not saying people are going to drop dead right now. We're worried about 15 or 20 years from now. We're worried about the effects of this chemical. The facilities don't exist to dispose of the stuff. We know it. So what are we supposed to do? Chase these people around? They're going to get rid of it someplace. Getting rid of PCBs often means dumping the chemical illegally, like these transformers dumped in this Alaskan landfill, or these capacitors illegally buried near Houston. In 1981, New Jersey authorities discovered that this refinery was mixing PCBs with oil, they were then selling the combined material as heating fuel, fuel that was being burned in New York City apartment buildings. The problem here in North Carolina also began with the illegal dumping of PCBs. In 1978, three men filled this truck with PCB oil and dumped 31,000 gallons of it along 210 miles of rural highway. The federal government pledged $2.5 million to clean up the PCB-contaminated dirt. They decided to bury the dirt in Warren County, which is largely poor and predominantly black. The residents took to the streets. We're going to stop the dump, and what's in there can be hauled right out on the same trucks it came in on. Since September 15th, there have been more than 500 arrests. 
as local residents joined by national civil rights leaders attempted to block trucks from entering the PCB landfill. We will fight to the last, and that is until every grain of PCB is removed from Warren County. We shall the illegal dumping of PCBs created this problem here in North Carolina, and environmental officials insist that if more PCB disposal sites are not set up around the country, thousands of pounds of the chemical may be dumped illegally into the environment. But if the people of this county are any indication, it may be extremely difficult to set up more PCB disposal sites. It seems that nobody wants chemical waste in their own backyard. For Nightline, Peter Lance, Afton, North Carolina. Joining us now to discuss the topic of PCBs are Dr. John Todd Hunter, Assistant Administrator for Toxic Substances with the Environmental Protection Agency. He's in our New York studio. Dr. Geraldine Cox, Vice President and Technical Director of the Chemical Manufacturers Association, who is here in our Washington Bureau. And also here in Washington, Dr. Ellen Silbergill, Chief Toxic Scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund, a private environmental group. Dr. Todd Hunter, uh, first of all, let's get some terms clear if we can. Is it the opinion of EPA that this is a toxic substance and that it ought to be disposed of? It's our opinion that it has a toxic potential, depending on exposure, and we believe that it should be disposed of in accordance with the mandate of Congress under the Toxic Substance Control Act. All right, now let's see if we can put that into English. What does that mean in terms of, uh, you, you say it's depending on exposure, what kind of exposure? Basically, there's nothing magic about the toxicity of a PCB. I think a great mythology has grown up around these materials. They are, uh, as oncogens, as carcinogens, they're not particularly potent, but they do have that property. You're saying uh, they, they, they do not cause cancer? No, they can cause cancer in laboratory animals. We presume they may pose that threat for humans. But if you compare them to other carcinogens, they're sort of low on the totem in terms of their activity. They're just not real hot carcinogens. Uh, they're not very acutely toxic. Our concern is over accumulation over a period of time in the human body. So we feel that the best thing we can do is avoid a situation where you have a high concentration of PCBs in one place where you can then get an accidental uh, spill which then contaminates food or water. That's our real concern at the agency. We think if we can eliminate that sort of problem, then the health and environmental impacts of PCBs will be minimized. All right. Explain, for example, the, the uh, San Francisco incident that we saw reported by Peter Lance in, in, the, uh, in the videotape report we just saw. Why was it necessary for all those people who were exposed to a minimal amount of PCB, why was it necessary for them to go home, take a shower, burn their clothes, you're saying it wasn't necessary? Until we know exactly what any given person was exposed to, which we wouldn't know in a situation like that in detail, it would be prudent to tell the people to take the greatest precaution that they could. In a situation like that where we have an explosion where oil of uh, varying degrees of contamination is scattered around and where varying amounts may get on people, we feel it's prudent to tell people to play it safe. All right, Dr. Silbergeld, uh, given this kind of apparent reluctance to, to really point the finger at PCB and say, yes, it is that dangerous, are you being alarmist then? Is your organization being alarmist with the kinds of recommendations that you make? We don't think so. We think we're following the fairly conservative mandate that was put forth by Congress five years ago. There is a mythology of PCBs. It's a remarkable mythology, and it's an attempt to overturn about 10 years of fairly well-established scientific evidence showing that PCBs are rather potent promoters and interact with many enzyme systems in the body to promote cancer, that they affect reproduction, they affect the immune system and the nervous system. That seems to be the mythology that's rampant today. But now you heard what Dr. Todd Hunter said. It seems to be a question of exposure, degree of exposure. Uh, could, you, could you at least unravel some of that mythology to the extent that folks who are living, let's say, next door to a telephone pole that has one of these uh, transformers or, or, or uh, you know, if someone has a capacitor near his house, need he automatically worry about the effects of PCB? The question of exposure to a chemical like PCBs is very difficult because it's accumulated and many of the PCBs, it's a whole group of chemicals of course, 
essentially remain in the body unchanged forever. So every exposure adds on to every other exposure. As we heard in the tape, as many as 90% of all Americans already have PCBs on board. So we're not talking about naive person experiencing PCBs being worried about the potential but you for are PCB not, uh, exposure. Forgive me for interrupting. You're not suggesting that 90% of all Americans now are, are facing the danger of uh, incurring cancer because they have been exposed to PCBs or have some traces of it in their body fat. Americans are exposed to a chemical soup of which PCBs are one of the most notable ingredients. Taking those chemicals together, it's probably conservative to say that we have greatly increased our overall risk for cancer. Dr. Cox, let me ask you, since you represent the, the Chemical Manufacturers Association, uh, without labeling you as the heavies in this, now, is there something that ought to be done about the use of PCBs? Are, are you prepared to concede that? Well, we should be handling all chemicals very carefully. Everything has the potential of being a problem. It's a matter of how much exposure we get and for how long. But we've had workers exposed to PCBs for up to 25 years, to the point where they did develop skin rashes, and yet their uh, cancer rate and other rates are well within the norm of the American public. In fact, in some cases, a little bit lower. So if it was such a potent material, these people who were exposed to very high concentrations should be showing the effects, and they're not. Well, I mean, you're almost suggesting that we set up, uh, I mean, it sounds as though you're almost suggesting that we set up spas in which we expose ourselves to PCPs so we don't get cancer. Not at all. What we want to do is allay people's fears. I think this is far more blown out of proportion than it is in terms of real danger. It is a cumulative material, but the body can get rid of it over time. Studies have shown that. And in fact, there are very few animal studies that actually show it as a carcinogen. There are more studies that show that it isn't than show that it is. Dr. Todd Hunter, I think you can understand that a great many people, I must include myself among them, are somewhat confused by what we're hearing here. Why, if indeed it is such a relatively benign chemical, and I stress the relatively, why did Congress then ban it? five years ago? Because there were a number of incidents both outside of this country and inside of this country in which PCBs in concentrated form spilled or otherwise entered the food chain and created a public health concern. Uh, in some incidents out of this country there have been adverse human effects to that sort of high exposure situation. We feel that this is what we need to avoid. We issued earlier this year a rule which would address some 40 to 45 percent of the PCBs that have ever been made, which are those which remain in electrical equipment and would require those PCBs which are near uh, food and feed processes to be phased out, taken out of service by 1985 and remaining PCB transformers and capacitors to be taken out of service uh, either when they fail or when we detect that they, in fact, are beginning to show a capacity to Let leave. me get Dr. Silbergeld in just in the last few seconds we have left. If it were kept away from food chains, would that be enough? No, it would certainly not be enough. I think it's extraordinary what we're hearing being said here, and that is that all animal data, all experiments are irrelevant to decision making. We have to wait for the bodies to drop. No, I think that's not exactly correct. I think what we have to do is look at the whole animal database and look where are we going to, in fact, buy public protection and not just the perception of protection. And I, I think that's where the argument really is. I agree, but I think EPA seems to have some problem in hearing that information and looking for that database. No, I think if, if the situation was as serious as you are presenting, the court which overturned the 1979 regulation of the agency would not have stayed its mandate. It would not have said, well, the regulation can be left in place until we get some more specific definitions of what you are calling enclosed processes and how you're going to handle electrical equipment. Uh, I don't think they would have done that if, in fact, the court had been convinced it was that serious. Let me just ask one final question. Isn't part of this problem the fact that you simply don't have the means to replace all those transformers and capacitors and that until you do, all of this is rather academic? That is a part of the problem, but we think we have to put pressure on the industry to move in that direction. Last fall, 
the agency was petitioned to allow the landfilling of large PCB capacitors. We felt that was an inappropriate use of precious landfill space because, as the report we saw points out, it is hard to site a landfill. And we mandated that, no, those things must continue to be crushed and incinerated. And so we felt we had to put some pressure on industry. All right, I wish we had more time. Mm -hmm. Dr. Todd Hunter, Dr. Cox, Dr. Silbergill, thank you all very much. In a moment, we'll have an update from Kathmandu, Nepal, on the Canadian mountain climbing team, now on Mount Everest. Behind me now is a live picture of the mountain range that includes Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. It, in fact, is right behind that cloud bank. A Canadian mountain climbing team is currently engaged in an assault on its summit, a story we've been covering throughout this week. Yesterday, there was an initial success. One Canadian and two Sherpa guides succeeded in making it to the top. Today, there was another attempt. And for the latest on today's developments, we're going to go live to correspondent Jack Smith in Kathmandu, Nepal. Jack? Hello, Ted. There are, we think, either three or four climbers on the mountain. They should be on the last ridge, making the last few thousand feet up to the top of Everest. We're sure that one of them ought to be Al Burgess, one of the toughest members on the team, but the others we're not sure of. The reason, because again, we have no radio contact with them. This time, the second summit team did bring a radio with them, but on the carry up to the high camp, one of the porters, one of the climbers who was carrying equipment for the summit team turned back. He apparently found the going too hard, and it was he who was carrying the radio. All right, Jack, we were watching uh, the live picture just a few moments ago and saw a small plane flying over the area. We're looking at the videotape of that right now. What's that plane doing up there? Well, if you remember last night, those spectacular aerials that were shot of Everest, the first in three years that have been filmed from that altitude, it was that plane that was taking them, and that plane is again doing it today. What we're going to try to do, though, this time, is to attach a small transmitter to the camera and try and beam them back here. We're not at all sure it will work, but that was the plane you were seeing. All right, in the few seconds that we've got left, Jack, any more attempts on the mountain after this? Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, I kind of doubt it. They will have put up probably their strongest climbers, and after a week down in base camp, the weather may have turned bad, and the, uh, the desire to go up again just may not be there. All right, Jack Smith, thank you. I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow on World News Tonight, a status report from national correspondent Richard Threlkill. The topic, the civil courts, where Americans are suing one another at a record rate. And tomorrow's first news is at 6 a.m. on ABC News This Morning with Steve Bell and Kathleen Sullivan. That's our report for tonight. This is Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been Nightline. If you'd like to obtain a transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $2 to Nightline, Box 234, Ansonia Station, New York, New York, 10023. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News.